true, Dr. Zayas. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Because we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show, Greg Carwood Company. Holy hell, higher side chatters, drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke, and making sure my third eye is thoroughly squeegeed clean from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood. And folks, we realize just how many holes our history really has, and we entertain a lot of ideas in the hopes to demystify the past and come out with a clearer picture of the human story. And sometimes these threads of research lead us to conclusions that are hard to fathom, and the answers sometimes become more epic than the questions ever suspected. Like, what if some of the most enigmatic structures we speculate about can be connected through the use of a lesser-known set of measurements? And what if these ancient measurements remained preserved in the deep recesses of Freemasonry? And what if these builders didn't stop at the Earth? Well, these are just a few of the stops on today's Roadmap to Realization and the crux of the decades of research done by today's guest, Christopher Knight. Chris became a writer almost by accident, as his curiosity into Freemasonry and megalithic structures led to a series of books written and co-written about this deep and deserving rabbit hole, including titles like Civilization I, Solomon's Power Brokers, Who Built the Moon, Before the Pyramid, and most recently, God's Blueprint. A topic I can't wait to get into with the man who knows the plan, Christopher Knight. Welcome to THC. Thank you, Greg. Good to be with you. I do concur. Good, sir. And I'm very excited for this. The subject matter you've been studying and the connections you've made really do blow my mind. And I suppose a good place to start is at the beginning, which <laughs> I believe was uh, an interest in Freemasonry, right? Um, completely an accidental beginning, yeah. In my early 20s, I thought, what do these guys get up to? I've read bad things about them and some good things. And I thought the best way to find out is to join, but that didn't throw any light in it at all. <laughs> um, so I, I, I spent um, many decades trying to find out where their rituals came from. Right on. So yeah, the uh, rituals of Freemasonry, they seem shrouded in mystique and that leads to all sorts of rumors. But seeing as how you've gone through some of these rituals firsthand, can you detail some of the strangeness you encountered with them? Um, yes, because uh, there's very, very little that's actually secret in Freemasonry. Um, and when my first book came out, a lot of Freemasons thought I was telling secrets, but I have never, ever once uh, told a secret I wasn't allowed to tell, hmm. um, because there really aren't too many. But I, I joined to try and find out uh, what, what these guys got up to, and the rituals were seriously weird, every bit as weird as I expected, and, and, and stranger again. But and then after a couple of years, I kept saying, well, what's this about? You know, we do these rituals to bring in candidates, and then we do more rituals to bring in more candidates. What's the output? What, you know, nobody knew, and nobody knew where the rituals came from. So um, I thought I need to try and find out. I mean, it's seriously strange. Mm -hmm. And most, most Freemasons will tell you, oh, I can't tell you what I do because it's a secret. But it isn't a secret at all. They don't tell you because they're embarrassed. Because if they told you what they did, it would seem like you do what? <laughs> That's crazy. Why'd you do that? And they'd have to say, I don't know, really. You know, it's easier to say, well, I can't tell you. You know, it's, um, it's all secret, but it's not at all. The only secrets are the means of recognition, which are completely ceremonial, ceremonial and totally unimportant. The actual rituals themselves, rituals are published, you know. Mm -hmm. So most of them, uh, it, it gets more tricky when you get to the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite, but, mm -hmm. um, um, there's a little more shrouding uh, going on there, but there's all sorts of degrees around the world, which um, um, I've joined many of them and uh, been involved with many of them. But I, I've, I've kept relatively junior in mainstream Freemasonry deliberately so that I can learn more um, without being compromised. Um, but all of the basic degrees, obviously, I went through in the 1970s. Interesting. And I, I know you did also put a lot of energy into tracing Freemasonry back as far as you could. There seems to be a lot of different theories and ideas on the subject, but what did your research show when you looked into it? Um, well, you don't need to get too theoretical about it because there is a, a, a great deal of evidence. It takes a lot of digging out. I've managed to get back about 6,000 years. Hmm. Um, I originally expected to get back four or 500 years because I have no interest in the esoteric or weird ideas or anything that I used to think of as airy-fairy. 
And I thought it was just very matter of fact. But it's far from matter of fact. <laughs> um, and it's very complicated. Uh, but there is hard evidence uh, of connections. A guy called Robinson did some fantastic work uh, connecting modern Freemasonry with the Templars. That was one of the early uh, routes that I checked out. He wrote Born of the Blood and um, became a Freemason on his deathbed, in actual fact. Hmm. And it was relatively, relatively easy. It only took a few years to substantiate that that was correct, that the Knights Templar or the rituals used by the Knights Templar appear to be the source of the core rituals within Freemasonry. So I then spent 20 years finding out where the Templars got their rituals from uh, by tracing back ancient Judaism. <laughs> Man, that's interesting. So you trace Freemasonry back 6,000 years, this tradition, back to the Knights Templar. That's well established. If we go before that, are there any groups that had this body of knowledge that we might recognize or are worth noting? Well, a body of knowledge, it is for sure. That, that, but that makes it sound like it's something in a chest, very sort of very <laughs> contained. It's much more, um, it's much broader than that. But w w what I found is the Knights Templar, who dug in the Temple of Jerusalem in the early 12th century, had found all sorts of things that turned them from being poverty-stricken nomarchs into the world's richest, most influential people within a handful of years. And so what I wanted to try and find out is what they had found and how they'd found it under the Temple of Jerusalem. And the Temple of Jerusalem was de destroyed in 70 AD by the Titus, the Romans, um, who killed 1.3 million Jews, hmm. according to <clears throat> the available evidence, in this terrible war. And the Jews, the Essenes in particular, hid their documentations under the Temple of Jerusalem and in other places, such as Qumran, where, we, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, which record what was buried under, under the Temple in Jerusalem, tell us exactly where they were and what was buried. Um, so everything was put underground at this period in the first century, very shortly after the killing of Jesus Christ and his brother James, this terrible war sprang up and everything was buried. So I had to try and work out what it was that these people possessed mm -hmm. that they buried that could have been dug up. And to do that, this was purely for personal interest. I wasn't thinking of writing a book or sharing the information with anybody particularly. Um, I went back to the earliest known times of pre judaism and reconstructed uh, what it could be that they buried. And I didn't expect to succeed, but uh, I pretty well had a clear idea because there are two or three strands of Judaism, and, and modern Judaism is, is little connected to the Enochian Judaism that was very, very important in that period. So it is somewhat complex, but for sure it follows down that route. But as you go back further in time, it gets richer uh, and more, more diverse. But uh, the evidence gets harder. My first book, The Harem Key, was fairly philosophical, trying to th put things together and make sense of patterns. Mm -hmm. And people could say, well, I disagree with that. And I'd say, fine, okay, I disagree. But <laughs> the evidence suggests to me there's this and this. But as the years have gone by, uh, particularly recent or relatively recent years working with Alan Butler, it's hard science. You know, we only deal in testable, checkable facts. So it isn't the case that someone can say, well, I disagree with that. You say, why? Where's your evidence? Mm -hmm. We're talking about testable, checkable, scientific facts now, um, <clears throat> which is very unusual in this, in this arena because archaeologists and theologists um, can be the world's worst for coming up with grand theories of the way things are because they've got a wonderful degree from the right university and they think their opinion is therefore extremely valuable to mankind <laughs> rather than actually setting out to prove what they're saying is correct. So it's somewhat unusual to, to be dealing with hard facts in this, this type of arena. But on this journey, particularly in recent years, I've undergone a major change in what I accept as uh, being real because I was very, very sort of matter of fact and very disapproving of um, what you might call fringe theories. <laughs> but now I'm in possession of what is deemed by many to be a fringe theory. But yet I have the evidence to substantiate it. And, and many heavy-duty scientists have looked at it and said, my God, yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's checkable, testable, and correct. So there's a bit of a battle going on here, but sort of a, 
standard wisdoms get passed down to universities, even though they're complete bunkum. So it takes a generation to uh, to shift some uh, old nonsense. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that. And uh, it is just a fascinating amount of research you've done. And I guess to uh, segue into the study of measurements, that's kind of where a lot of this evidence uh, gets into some really outrageous concepts that I don't think many people are familiar with. But um, talk to us about how this interest in Freemasonry led you into this study of measurements. Um, Well, everything I've done, even though the various books I've written, seem to be on or can appear to be on quite different subjects. Everything is a continuum. Everything follows through. But there was something of a break point. uh, And that's, I guess, when Alan Butler read uh, some of my material and he contacted me and said, I don't quite know why, but he said, I think my work is meeting your work here. And true enough, when I met him, it it was indeed. And um, the origins of Freemasonry are like laying the understanding of stones, but not stones for building houses per se. It's stones that were used in astrological observation and in ancient, super ancient times, things like Stonehenge and structures that were built to observe the moons of stars and planets and so forth. That's what the stonework was all about, um, like the ancient monuments. And um, there was a particular period when Alan and I stepped back to look at some work done by one engineer from Oxford University, a renowned professor of mathematics. The, the building of mathematics at Oxford University is named after him today, uh, the, the Alexander Tom building. Now, this guy was a genius, and he spent 50 years surveying megalithic sites, and he identified that there was a standard unit of measurement or a series of measurements around this one core unit that had been used that is more accurate than anything we do today in terms of building. It's like human hair's width. Hmm. And everyone thinks that the Stone Age period were completely the Flintstones, you know, sort of rough and ready, you know, sort of uh, playing your records at the beak of some bird, you know. <laughs> right. But it wasn't. It was super science. And he argued this, and the archaeologist said, oh, you're an idiot. You're just a, a, an engineer from Oxford University. What do you know about archaeology? We shall ignore you because you're wrong. And he said, look, I don't know why I'm right, but this is, I've surveyed hundreds and hundreds of sites uh, over 50 years from Northern Scotland down to, down to Western France. And I tell you, this unit was used everywhere over a thousand years and thousands of square miles. So I came up with the one thought, which was if this unit of measure really did exist, it wouldn't be an abstraction. It wouldn't, someone didn't wake up one day and say, Hey, I think this is a really neat length. <laughs> let's let's everyone use it. Right. What is it? What's this length? Well, it's just the length of this stick. So let's make this the holy stick. He admitted that wouldn't work. You couldn't do it. It physically wouldn't work. So my gamble was that somehow there was something in nature that was repeatable that everyone could in isolation, if they knew how to do it, could work this out. Well, it doesn't take too too long to work out that there's only one thing. Thomas Jefferson did it when he tried to set out to make a, a new system of measurements for the, for the new USA, although they weren't adopted. And that is the movement of the Earth on its axis, which is perceived as the stars moving overhead. So if you can measure the movement of those stars appropriately, you can produce units of length, of time, of weight, of mass, of capacity, of everything, even temperature. Wow. And it all stems. That was the hunch. And very, very quickly, bingo, we found exactly, because it's so basic and so important, exactly what he did. And then afterwards, after publishing the book to say this, we found the archaeological evidence that fitted it. Now, the proof of any good theory is to subsequently find evidence that bears it out. Well, that's exactly what happened. We found huge amounts of really important archaeological evidence that just bears this out completely. So it, it, it's turned from opinion and theory to check out the facts, man, you know? <laughs> yeah. Let's not debate nonsense. Let's debate some hard facts. Get your ruler out. Check this. Um, but it, the weird, really seriously weird thing, of course, is that this system that existed five and 6,000 years ago, which is very demonstrably there, is not 
uh, something that disappeared. It is the basis of the imperial measurement system. It is the basic of the metric system. Hmm. Both are two halves of the same thing and can be tracked back, and they're both perfectly astronomically um, perfect within this system, which shows an understanding not only of the Earth, but of the moon and the sun as well. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. and It's crazy. It is, it is. And let's look at some of that archaeological evidence. What are some of the first big structures we see using this set of measurements? Some of the henges, right? Um, exactly. The really astonishing ones we found were not far from where I live in uh, in Yorkshire in, in England, which is happy coincidence for me because I've traveled all around the world looking at all sorts of things, which is very strange that it's relatively close to uh, to my home. But um, they were building these things uh, five and a half thousand years ago before they started building in stone. And there are um, three gigantic henges, which are circular earthworks, which are still there. And they're a thousand years old than the pyramids of Giza. And they are, the pyramids of Giza are an exact copy of them. Right. The center is identical. It's reduced scale because the pyramids aren't as big, but they're for exactly the same purpose. The really interesting thing is once you understand the principles that had to be used to cite the pyramids of Giza uh, near Cairo, all the calculations were done in England at this site. It's very evident that I don't know whether the Egyptian astronomers came to this location to um, to borrow this thousand year old information, or whether the people that built it a thousand years earlier were Egyptians that had come to this site because it's very astronomically important uh, points on the Earth. So I'm not saying that us Brits invented the pyramids at all. I don't know who did it. All I know is where they did what and how and when, because you can work all that out from the astronomical effect, uh, effects. Um, and the pyramids, for sure, are a copy of um, Orion's Belt. A good friend of mine, Robert Baval, has written hugely about that uh, Orion uh, arrangement. Mm -hmm. In my view, he's got it slightly upside down, but we still have heated debates about that, so Robert and I. But the fact remains that this site is a 1,000 years old, far bigger, and exactly the same layout is in the uh, UK here. And the dimensions of it are um, perfect for the measurement of system, the, the system of measurement that uh, we'd identified from this Professor Alexander Tom to the point where th they are so detailed and so accurate that they led us to understand a very special nature of pi. And we were contacted by a professor in Canada who happens to have a PhD in physics and in chemistry, which is unusual. And he said, this is, this, this is actually a breakthrough for mathematics, let alone, um, archaeology. How on earth have you done this? And we said, well, we didn't do it. These ancients did it. All we've done is spot it. Mm -hmm. So, um, these are very, very important sites and, and, and little known. They're at a place called Thornbury. And, um, there are, tens of thousands of sites in Western Europe that show exactly the same thing. Yeah, I think that would surprise some people that Stonehenge really is just one of many henges, many stone circles out there. And, uh, and, a, and a very recent one, a very young one. Yeah, Stonehenge being one of, the, one of the youngest. And there's not a lot of researchers out there making that connection between these henges and Egypt, I mean, that, and the pyramids, I mean, that's pretty uh, radical. Uh, to play devil's advocate, do you think that these two different groups could have stumbled upon this information independently, kind of like Jefferson did? Or is there evidence that there was actually a connection? That's a good question, because for sure, there are some basic science facts that would, that would cause people to stumble on the same things, as, as you say, as, as Thomas Jefferson did. But that is not the case, because there are too many connections like the the basic unit of area that was adopted for use in ancient Egypt is identical to um, that used at Stonehenge. There clearly was uh, an interchange between the two cultures, or it was one culture. There may have been an international priesthood that exchanged ideas and went to different places on the surface of the planet to get different astronomical advantage, because the Thornbury site, for example, is exactly one-tenth of the polar circumference of the Earth from the North Pole, and has other features as well. So they picked out these locations for very precise reasons. So 
it may well be that there was a single, what we might call priesthood or group of scientists. I mean, the priests, the scientists were the same thing. Stonemasons, they were all, you know, the one of the same people. Right. It all went backwards a little bit when when the kings rose up in Egypt, the period of the kings when they became vain and they wanted to this this magic and they wanted to turn it into something that made them live forever. And the scientists will have gone, oh, my God, what's he doing? Um, it's not about that. It's much more important than that. But there again, having said that, there's very clear evidence that also what they were doing was directly connected to the essence of what being a human is. And it had all sorts of connections to the way the brain functions. Um, the, the, their science was was far from backward, and I and I speak here as someone that just doesn't believe this sort of stuff normally. <laughs> right. I've been an atheist to all intents and purposes all my life, and I'm no longer. And I've been very disbelieving of um, non-standard theories until relatively recently, and now I'm I have to. Uh, admit that I've, I've had it wrong for many, many years. <laughs> Man, uh, so much information. I'm Me being conspiratorial minded, I'm definitely intrigued by the idea of an international priesthood looking for vantage points around the planet. I think that's pretty interesting. But you mentioned that you think uh, Baval has it upside down when talking about Orion's Belt and the pyramids. What, what do you mean by that? I think a lot of the listeners will be familiar with Baval's ideas. What do you mean by he has it backwards or upside down? Yeah, sure. His main critics have, have, have said he appears to have it upside down and he says nonsense. I've, I've done this properly. Mm-hmm. And because it doesn't quite fit, uh, with Orion's belt, he said, well, they weren't that good or engineers. If they, they couldn't be that perfect. And I said, look, Robert, look at it the other way up. And it is absolutely perfect mm-hmm. as indeed the Thornbury engines are. These guys were not dumb. They had methods of, which I which I believe I, I have at least one way of doing it, of uh, transferring what you see in the sky onto the ground with huge accuracy, with, with very simple tools. But what I believe that they did is that they believed that the, the world above was uh, on the same plane. So the people in the afterlife, the Duat, were looking down onto the pyramids. So the pyramids, if you were looking beyond the stars, if they were on a canopy, they they would look the same looking down, whereas Robert's looking at them as a mirror image. They weren't a mirror image. They were looking straight down. So, wow. Um, I believe they are, the slight inaccuracy is due to the fact that the he's got the uh, the wrong star at each end, the center star being the same in, in both cases. Got you. Literally upside down. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is just um, a, a simple way of looking, interpreting the way that they wrote about um, the afterlife, they looked down to the earth from above and they saw that if you took the pinnacles of the pyramid, the three Giza pyramids and other pyramids upwards, they would map onto the stars under their feet, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is a very simple way of looking at it and it's then perfect. But Robert's got a lot of energy invested in the original argument and doesn't want to doesn't want to move good fine you know we continue to have the debates and mm. over a few beers every now and again because i have a house near in, where, near where he lives in spain uh so we have get togethers and uh and his brothers are very scientific he's an ar- uh, architect and um so we have some good uh, heated discussions all good fun <laughs> right on man sounds like a great place to be a fly on the wall Now, the listeners should know we did just take a slight break to switch your microphone because I was noticing a crinkling sound in the background, maybe a loose wire or something, but I think it might have been a bit distracting, so we did change it up. But to hop back into this thing, when we're talking about ancients having superior knowledge and how this could be, one of the major ideas is that of an international priesthood, like you mentioned, culture cedars, or they've been called the Watchers, which I'm sure we've all heard of. In your work, you've also referred to them as an unidentified creative agency, and I like that term too. But you mentioned that there are localized differences in the material in the various pockets you found it used, but the commonalities are pyramid building and Venus worship, and it's a curious thing. But why do you think these two tenets were always so important? Um, Pyramids uh, seem to appear in every culture around the world, and I don't quite understand that. 
other than they are artificial mountains, if you like. So if you want to reach to the gods, you go to the top of a mountain traditionally. So if you don't have a mountain or you don't have the mountain where you want it, you build a pyramid. And there were pyramids in the United States before Columbus, um, for example. Mm -hmm. They're in every culture. But the worship of Venus is very different um, because it is like a, a clock. Over 40 years, it perfectly uh, measures time to an accuracy of a fraction of a second. So if you understand the movements of Venus every eight years, and then more particularly every 40 years, you've got a, a superb calendar. And it was the way of timekeeping, the basis of timekeeping before atomic clocks, clocks were invented in the 1950s. So <clears throat> the, the tracking of Venus has always been super important to any any uh, scientifically orientated culture. And, of course, uh, science and astronomy is, uh, has tended to become the basis of the magic and the, the voodoo as things regress somewhat. And um, lesser people who don't really understand the science think it's something to do with the gods and so on. So it, gets, it sort of all merges, but it's heavy-duty science. Hmm. Yeah, I think this thing about Venus is really so amazing, man. And I understand what you're saying about magical interpretations and regression, but I think there's a lot of real magic out there, too. And I've heard the pentagram symbol itself, the five-pointed star, was derived from following the path of Venus. And I know you've done work on Roslyn Chapel, which is another place where we see the path of Venus encoded, right? Um, yeah, there's... Um... The, the, the Roslyn Chapel has got really the six-sided star, which is the symbol of Jerusalem, because Ros Roslyn, it's not a chapel, never was a chapel, in my view, mm -hmm. was built as a, as a copy of the Jerusalem Temple by the people who were the inheritors of the knowledge of the, the Knights Templar, who excavated under the temple between um, uh, 1117 and 1127. Now, the, the six-sided star the Star of David or the Star of Solomon or whatever you want to call it, which is two equilateral triangles on top of each other, is actually the astronomical zip code for, for Jerusalem because if you measure the angles of the sunrise and sunset, uh, they are 60 degrees, so they will naturally form that star. So that symbol is, is actually the symbol of Jerusalem, which was first adopted by the Knights Temple. It's not a Jewish symbol at all, uh, or at least not a modern Jewish symbol. Hmm. Uh, it's a super ancient Jewish symbol, but not um, uh, Judaism of the synagogue of today. And in fact, the, the synagogues copied it from the Knights Templars in the Middle Ages because they thought, hey, that's pretty neat. So they started to use that six-sided star. But that is the basis of what's in um, Roslyn Chapel. And a certain fiction, fiction writer that used Roslyn Chapel in his best-selling book pinched my observation about that. Uh, be the basis uh, of, of Rosling Chapel, although he claimed it was carved into the, the floor, which it isn't. It's just the core of the uh, design of the, the main structure. Hmm. Yeah, I find that so fascinating how they could even do something like that. But So we have this connection between some of these old megalithic sites. We have uh, Stonehenge and a connection to the Great Pyramids. Obviously, the builders had the same set of measurements. That alone is pretty radical. But tell us how the moon actually fits into this context? <clears throat> well, I ended up writing a book provocatively called Who Built the Moon? <laughs> uh, because Alan Butler and I wrote a book called Civilization One, uh, identifying the existence of these measurements, that all this whole system of measurements from uh, ancient times based around what Alexander, Professor Alexander Tom called the megalithic yard. We found that it was entirely geodetic uh, in that it, it fits the earth perfectly um, on the basis of a 366 degree earth because that's the number of degrees that were originally because there are 366 rotations of the earth in one year and they considered one rotation to be a degree it was later neatened up to 360 degrees in a circle just to make it more mathematically usable but they originally were 366 and this unit of measurement is perfect on the earth now, then we discovered that it's perfect on the moon. There are exactly 100 megalithic yards to a megalithic second on the moon. There are 366 on the Earth, and there are 40,000 on the sun. Perfect, you know, to all, to all measurable levels. And we tried every other planet 
um, and the solar system is nothing, nothing at all. Mm -hmm. But it works perfectly for those three bodies, which is highly improbable. And then you start to look at what else is known about the moon, and it goes beyond improbable, as many Soviet and latterly Russian scientists and American NASA scientists and scientists from all around the world have observed the moon is a very, very strange object. <laughs> and it displays all the characteristics of being artificially created and put in, it, in its position. The mathematics of its structure are such that it's completely a copy and, and a yin and yang of the Earth, not only for its dimension and its movements and its spin. Every aspect about it is a complete um, twin of the Earth. And this doesn't apply to any other known moon anywhere. Hmm. It reeks of a blueprint. <laughs> um, there's design going on. Right. Yeah. You say in the book that it was built like a Swiss clock. And I, I really like that analogy. It is a hard pill to swallow for some that it could be artificial. I mean, something of that of that scope. But the more you look at space, I guess, the more you see that the math is just too precise, that it couldn't have come about naturally. I'm far from the first person. Uh, and and uh, Alan Butler, my co-researcher on this, we're far from the first people to say this. Lots of people have said it for different reasons. We're just bringing on in new evidence that is like seriously hard that supports what's already been said. Of course, the casual observer will say, what? That's ridiculous. Of course the moon's not. But then have they ever thought, why is an eclipse? Is it perfectly the same size as the sun? Because it's completely blocking out. It's because the moon is one four hundredth of the diameter of the sun, but it's one four hundredth of the distance away. So they fit perfectly. Not three nine nine, four hundred. And these numbers keep reappearing. It's, it's deliberate, as Professor Paul Davis, a physicist, says, if you want to communicate over huge periods of time, you don't do what SETI does, send out radio messages. You put lumps of rock in space to communicate a pattern, and anyone with intellect will go, hey, that's not natural, that's weird, and will start to pay attention. And that's what apparently what is going on here. Now, okay, so people may say, if they're listening now and think, that's ridiculous. Of course no one's built the moon. Well, that's fine. That's that's your theory. Try Try some facts. Look at the facts and then see if you can come back and say that. I mean, <laughs> I would have laughed at it. I would have gone, oh, my goodness, no. How silly. But having gone through the facts in detail, you've got to come up and go, oh, I don't like this, but it's a fact. I have to know facts. you got to. And uh, whenever a radical idea like that is proposed, one of my favorite things is – when you do realize just how often, like you said, you're not the first to come to this kind of conclusion. And as radical as it is, when you look back at certain free thinkers, certain intellectuals who came to the same conclusion, it becomes a little easier to enter entertain when you see from different decades, different time periods, smart people, smarter than me, who actually will go out on a limb and say something like that. There must be some real indications. Lots and lots and lots of them. But um, you need to step aside and look in detail. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, for example, when he looked at ancient measurements, he said, how come a cubic foot of water holds exactly 1,000 fluid ounces of, of distilled water? He said, that is beyond all possibility. So he looked back at ancient measurements and said, something going on here from deep antiquity. These, this is not happenstance. This is not accident. There is some design deep lost in history going on here. And he was as smart a guy as you will ever come across. I mean, he, he and his fellow founding fathers were just like geniuses. But what the work he did there with the tools that he had available was astonishing. But he's just one of many. There are all sorts of people saying, coming to the same conclusions for different reasons. And it's very easy just to go with the status quo and think, Oh, of course, the moon's uh, na a natural object. The fact it's completely different in its structure to anything known in the universe is, well, I didn't even know that and probably unimportant. It is important. Do learn it. Mm -hmm. These things are so important if we want to understand our future. 
we have to understand our past. And if something is going on, something big is going on, of course we need to know about it. Of course. And in terms of devolution, I really do see this. I mean, the old founding fathers did seem to be on a higher level versus the politicians of today. And then look at the writing and language of that time and how things are written at a fifth grade level today. It seems clear there's been regression, but I'm skeptical and I'm curious. Do you think it's some big unfortunate accident that we've gotten less intellectual or is it the result of an orchestrated campaign from the top? Because behind the curtain, it seems like important knowledge is still traded and shared, just not with us. I've um, spent quite a lot of years saying that that's a completely unnecessary conclusion and almost certainly wrong. Um, But I'm certainly less sure now. (laughs) Well, I know for a fact that there are certain people, there there is a group of people that are more advanced than or haven't regressed as much as others have that does exist. How much power they exert, I don't know, but they, they've they been pretty important in Washington, D.C. over the last few hundred years. Mm-hmm. And that sounds incredibly conspiratorial. And um, I've always sort of despaired of people that have those sorts of views, but <laughs> uh, the evidence is rock solid, you know. Right. I love it, man. And a little bit more about the moon. I mean, this is so epic. Who could have done this? Could it have been the cedars of knowledge many, many years ago on a previous pop-in? No. Um, this is from the beginning of uh, of time. I mean, the moon is pretty well known to be largely made out of material removed from the Earth's surface, which is largely now the Pacific. It doesn't have a central core like the Earth. It has uh, various... Uh, gravitational fields just under its surface distributed around it. It's not natural. It doesn't, have, and it's not dense enough. Um, and its positioning is completely improbable. And its position now is exactly in the, in the position to alert us to it, to its importance. It hasn't always been in that position. It's moved out and out and out. So it's, it's speaking to us now. And in my book, God's Blueprint, my most recent book, I've suggested that God has done this to uh, make a connection. Now, I'm not talking about the God of religion. Oh, good. I'm not any sort of, I don't belong to any religion. It's just there is an absence of words in the English language to describe what you're talking about. I'm talking about a higher being that designed everything and for sure designed the universe. And it, not only the, the solar system, but the, the universe, 13 and half billion years ago and the whole in my view the whole thing was done for one reason and that was to produce humans it sounds very arrogant but i've got good reason for believing that to be the case obviously i can't categorically prove that i can i can prove that the solar system does but the laws of the universe um, are completely improbable to produce us so i i and i certainly don't see any evidence that lots of people will argue with me at this for with this uh, but i see no evidence of there being any other life intelligent life anywhere in the universe uh, i think we're it and we have a huge responsibility as such because we're the, the the leading edge of the creator and that i call god and, and this, this entity and there are ways of explaining what this entity might be but that's that's pure theory but the fact is that it's it's pretty indisputable that there is a design going on here. I mean, take Professor Anthony Flew, guy, for example. He is the was probably the greatest philosopher of his age. He died relatively recently um, at a good old age, and he spent his entire career being a champion of atheism, saying, writing books and papers, and his whole career, and a very famous man saying. There is no need for religion. It's ridiculous. The idea of God's ridiculous. And he turned around at the end of his life, not because he was frightened of dying, um, and said, the evidence has now become clear. My life's work is wrong. There is a, a plan. There is a creation here. It's inescapable. The scientific evidence is there. I have to say I'm wrong. And he died. Without any religion, he didn't believe he was going to go to heaven or anything like that. He just said, there is a grand plan. 
believe it, take it on board. And there's lots of people like that. The majority of people who are scientifically trained uh, in the USA, for example, either believe in a creator or are completely open to the idea only minority have rejected it. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic for sure. And when you look at the the details of the sun, moon, earth system, yeah, you can kind of rule out randomness as the factor. Um, but, if, but if we are it, if if there are no other intelligent humanoid creatures in the universe of any kind, what's the deal with this uh, with this this God, this creator, this higher being where obviously there's some type of, uh, of life that isn't human. Um, not so. No, I mean, that's, um, a very, very ancient arg argument. Thomas Aquinas sort of dealt with that one, um, a long time ago that <laughs> you, you can't say because there is a God, there must have something gone before it. So who created God and the, the Bible was originally in the plural that, God was talking amongst, there was a group of them talking who said, let us create man mm -hmm. um, in our image. It was all plural. But that, that's, that's just folklore, of course, but, but it's interesting. But I think there is a force there, and there are, there are candidates. There are, there, it's possible to philosophize about candidates, but I think it's important just not to try and solve that one. First of all, you've got to accept is it random? Is, are we just the sort of result of um, complete happenstance of just lumps of atoms crashing into one another from this presumed Big Bang? Or is there a god of Judaism, of Christianity, of Islam, Hinduism, whatever? Or is there something different? Is there, is there just a pattern? Is there a plan? Well, religion's in its own place, and it's got its own people that are adherents have got their own beliefs for uh, based in revelation of people and prophets gone pa in the past and that's fine and that's for them to believe in but if you have a scientific bent you've actually got to say well what does the science tell me well actually the science tells you that there is a pattern that the notion of randomness is perverse you're being silly basically of course, you can be lazy and just sort of say, well, it sounds reasonable to say it's all, it's all just chaos and accident. Well, actually, no, it doesn't fit the facts. So if you're interested in facts, um, you've got a attention. And if you find it difficult then to sort of identify who this, I call it this entity God, but so just the one of a better word. You, you can't identify who the God is. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> it doesn't stop the fact that something or somebody or whatever you want to call it has done it. It's like you find a, somebody who's been very clearly murdered. Just because you can't work out what the murder is doesn't mean they weren't murdered. Yeah. You've got to, you've got to take the facts as you find them. That is true. And it does seem like the earth peoples just like an apple tree apples, but you do entertain a few other ideas in who built the moon as to who it could have been or what it could have been. And my favorite idea is human time travelers. But as out there as it could be, how could that be possible if the moon is needed to sustain life on the planet? Doesn't that kind of create a paradox if we're to assume humanity started on the Earth? No, there's no paradox there at all. Only an apparent paradox, because most people aren't very good at dealing with apparent paradoxes. <laughs> that's me. Yeah, that's most people. <laughs> I mean, like... Try and do a, um, a self-help course in uh, quantum mechanics. You'll probably get confused because uh, it's not um, entirely simple or logical. The only theory, uh, and I put out three in Who Built the Moon, that there's potential candidates, the only one that is scientifically squeaky clean is the human time travel one because all serious scientists now accept that travel backwards in time uh, is possible and will become possible, not necessarily for, for individuals, for people to do it, but for materials to do it, mm -hmm. for sure. There are, isn't, I don't think there's anybody that's sort of really serious suggesting that that isn't the case. So uh, if at some point in the future we became capable of uh, sending some sort of drones back 
that could create many black holes, and I'm being poetic here, I don't know what I'm talking about really, <laughs> uh, to, to hoover up uh, chunks of the Earth's crust to create the moon to the right density and then place it in the right position, they could do that. So it's, it's the only one that fits the facts, because another one is that the god of religion just did it miraculously, but that doesn't actually help, or that aliens from somewhere else came and did it. But you're talking about very, very early on in the uh, development of the after the Big Bang, and where would these people have come from, or these creatures come from, why would they have done it, and why invent something that doesn't exist? We know humans exist. We know time travel is entirely accepted as a scientific possibility. So why invent these little green men from the planet Zog um, when there's no evidence at all for any life of any description, even microbes out there? So it's a case of um, just going for the, for the most rational answer for me on that. So that's where I was when I wrote Who Built the Moon. Each of my books, I'm, my own thinking matures and changes. And, and I, you know, I'd really love to hear from anyone that's got other ideas, you know. Let, but let's agree on the facts first, and, and then we can all debate um, the possibilities. <laughs> That's a fair point. And uh, I, too, was an atheist for a long time, and I had psychedelic experiences that kind of uh, shook me from that core belief. But I guess in this context of, of the moon, if someone built it, wouldn't the idea of intelligent humanoid creatures be more likely than a supreme spiritual entity? Because at least we know that intelligent humanoids exist. We don't really have the same evidence of highly intelligent spiritual entities existing. Well, I, th I think, again, you're trying to rationalize it in, sort of, in terms of the traditions of Western cultural thought, which is entirely logical. But I'm not talking about a spiritual entity, a spirit, spiritual in the sense of... Um, a benign figure that looks after us and looks down and is, is, is stationed somewhere that cares about us on a one-for-one -one basis. It could just be the cold logic of the material that brought itself into existence to have a determination to, to transcend the end of the universe. We're told by scientists that you project everything forward and we will end up with all matter evenly dispersed everywhere um, as a series of atoms a tiny bit above absolute zero of porridge of nothingness. Now, supposing if the universe had somehow created itself at this big bang point when there was nothing and then there was something, there was time, there was matter, and there was this explosion, and somehow this, and I'm, I'm being poetical here, but this material decided that it didn't want to have this fate of being this equally dispersed um, porridge just above absolute zero, Therefore, it had to get an intelligent bit of itself. Now, human beings are the Earth. We are part of the Earth. We think of ourselves as being on the Earth, but we're not. We are the Earth. Right. So we're like the, new, the, the neurons, the intelligent, the brain of the Earth, if you like, us and other high, higher animals. And all animals are one. All life is one on the Earth, for, for my money, that is. And we're on this surface of the Earth, like the cells on a brain, and what if we're charged to become intelligent enough to really understand how to steer the course and direction of the whole universe? Is that our mission? <laughs> um, if it is, we've got to stop doing these silly, crazy things we do to nearly wipe ourselves out. We, we've got a, a bigger responsibility if that's the case. And I also believe from my research is that there is – there, there is information and text and communications from this force embedded in us that we need to release and can release to take instruction of what we need to do. And we're just part of this greater force. Now, that's very philosophical, and people you know, can disagree with that, obviously, because it's, um, it's yet to be uh, anything approaching proof, but the suggestions are all there. Mm -hmm. So it transcends rel religious thought per se, but it's not. It doesn't displace religious thought. Um, I, I, th I think they can be bedfellows. That's fair. Yeah, I, I could see how that could be. And 
DNA does point to some type of code, too. That is an interesting thread. But another thing you wrote in the Who Built the Moon book that caught my attention was this little paragraph here. You said, perhaps the values programmed into the Earth by the unidentified creative agency were so fundamental that any intelligent life form evolving on the Earth would respond to them. The relatively recent discovery that pendulums go haywire during a total eclipse could point to brief interruptions of this earthly harmony. And I didn't know this about pendulums, but I have had guests that talk about the importance of the eclipses and even equate them to some sort of system reset or hack. And it could be an interesting clue. What are your thoughts on this? I I, I like to, over the years, dig out the facts, but as, uh, to get to a fact can take tens of years. It can, you know, and and you may never get there anyway. Right. On the journey, I've spotted odd things, weird things, or... Um, Things don't quite fit, and you can't make sense of them. So you you park them up in the corner over here, in the top left hand corner of your brain, and you carry on. And then fifteen years later or whatever, something pops up. And you think, ah, I think I know well, that piece fits in the jigsaw puzzle now. And pendulums are like that. I had to look into pendulums. Uh, Thomas Jefferson used pendulums. It's the way of measuring. Uh, it's the basis of all measurements it, it, to swing a pendulum because it's so. Uh, mathematically perfect and precise. But as you say, as I report in Who Built the Moon, they go haywire, or they can go haywire during total eclipses, and no one fully understands that. And there's no particular uh, understanding or reason as to why that should be. And it, it sort of points, it, it, this is something in the corner of my mind, I'm waiting to find out what it might mean. It sort of points to there is some change in the way gravity is experienced. Uh, and, of course, we don't really understand gravity. There's been some good progress made recently into, into understanding the nature of gravity. But this, this long, act, long distance acting, very weak force, it's to do with the mass of objects, but it changes under this. When, once the, the moon passes in front of the sun, for example, and shields the Earth, in its normal daylight condition from the, the rays of the sun or the gravity of the sun, it, it, they can go, woo, <laughs> but nothing else can make them do that. Earthquakes can make them shudder, of course, but um, there's something going on, and it's well worthy of fuller investigation. But I, I, I'm just, um, uh, like Thomas Jefferson, I'm a, a curious amateur. That would take you know some uh, serious physicists, astrophysicists to uh, investigate Right. But there are some seriously interesting threads there. Definitely over my head, for sure. But um, well, yeah, uh, too, yeah. An, another interesting aspect of your work is that this measurement system isn't just reserved for ancient things. It's also embedded in Washington, D.C. You mentioned it a little bit ago, but we know Freemasons played a huge part in this setup. What can you tell us about its incorporation into Washington, D.C.? The interesting thing is that... Um, the ancient structures, such as I was describing these henges uh, in England, uh, Stonehenge included, they exhibit the use of this so-called megalithic yard identified by Alexander Tom, 82.966 of a metre, uh, sorry, centimetres, 82.966 uh, centimetres. Incredibly accurate. And they were used in units of 366. Now. I'd been looking at uh, henges all over Western Europe for patterns of uh, using this this system in 732 uh, around the, the circumference, which is double the number of megalithic yards for the horizon. Getting complicated there. But I happened to look at um, Washington, D.C., and I was looking at the, the city from... Skype from above, I was looking for a, uh, something because I was about to go to Washington, D.C., and I was looking for something else, and I spotted this sort of circle, which um, includes the vice president's uh, residence, and um, I thought, whoa, that, that looks remarkable, like a henge. And it, it was a henge, but it was built by the U.S. Navy. Wow. And it was built by the U.S. Navy um, back in the 19th century to create naval charts. And they had built it to uh, megalithic 
standards and units. And I thought, that is seriously weird. Yeah. Then I came further down into the, the city itself and started looking at the layout of the design. And the whole damn thing is built using megalithic yards and 366 units of, between all of this DuPont Circle and uh, all every little bit of the the city. And then from the, the park south of the White House, there is a, an ellipse. In the center of this ellipse, which is mega important, is ex- an exact number of megalithic uh, seconds of arc to the Capitol building. And then to the center of the Pentagon and back again is exactly 33 degrees. Now, that's pretty weird in itself, and I'm talking to an accuracy of inches. And the door to the Pentagon faces uh, directly to the Capitol building. So we started to look into um, the Pentagon because that's obviously the most recent. The, uh, the, the part by the White House has had a very strange history. Um, but you think, well, the Pentagon, of course, was only built at the beginning of the Second World War. Uh, very rapidly indeed. So you look at FDR, uh, Roosevelt, building that. Now, he was a 33rd degree Freemason. Hmm. Uh, 32nd at the time, he became 33rd degree. And um, he de- designed the Pentagon and its location. It was going to be built at a place called Roslyn, just a little bit north of Pratt's Bottom, where it's now built. The place it was called Pratt's Bottom. Um, and Roslyn, they'd started building in, in Roslyn because they knew, they, they knew the war was coming. Um, <clears throat> and they knew they needed a headquarters for the, uh, military and intelligence and the, the new hub. Mm-hmm. And Franklin D. Roosevelt said, um, stop. I don't want it there. I want it down here. And he pointed to a place that was all bog and it was completely derelict and unsuitable. And they said, Mr. President, that's ridiculous. And he said, look, who's the boss around here? I want it there, exactly building like this. I want it building to this design. And the design that he insisted upon using is a design specified in the 32nd degree of Freemasonry, hmm. which represents the five uh, factors of the, of the forces of defense of the United States of America. And it, it faced the Capitol building. And because it was built there, it fits into this ancient old design for the city that stems right back. And even the Second War Memorial that was built in this century conforms precisely to these ancient measurements. So whoever's doing it, still planning it, and still well aware of the units that they need to use and the patterning that they need to use. So as a Freemason, I... I been on television and radio in the US and giving talks so many times to people who said, is there a Masonic conspiracy? And I said, don't be ridiculous. Of course there isn't. It's pretty harmless. But then this happens. So I spoke to a friend of mine who was a 33rd degree Freemason in the US and said, what well, can you tell me about what goes on? Because I can find anything I want about any of the degrees. But the 33rd degree gets a bit difficult. I'm a member of the 33rd degree, but not, but not of the Scottish Rite, I'm of, of, a, uh, of a different Rite. So he explained to me that um, they actually took their instructions from somebody that came from outside, no, well, from, from the Supreme Council. Who do they take their instructions from? They take it from somebody outside. Where does he come from? Well, nobody knows. And he tells you what to do and think, and there's no voting, there's no argument, you just do it? Yes. Wow. Who is he? We don't know. I feel like, what? Wow, so at the top of Freemasonry, they're basically just listening to some puppet master, some Supreme Council that they don't even ask questions about where it comes from. I'm not going to get popular for saying that, but because I've spent so many years defending Freemasonry. And it, it isn't Freemasonry because, strictly speaking, there are only sort of four official degrees and the Scottish Rite isn't officially Freemasonry. But I spent a lot of years tracing back <clears throat> the original degrees 
of the Scottish variety of Freemasonry, and they're actually very different in large parts of the ones that are used today. They've been changed um, out, of, out of sight, and the original ones are far more interesting. <laughs> but it does appear that there there is um, there is that there is a conspiracy, for want of a better word, and despite being called conspiratorial, I'm not. But I don't know what's going on, but it appears to be a beneficial conspiracy of trying to draw things together for the benefit of people generally in the way that they see their interpretation of what is right. So I don't, I don't think there's anything, my reading is there's nothing negative about it. I mean, Washington's a beautiful city, and they built that, and that's, that's great. It is, but it's caused a lot of damage in the world too. Um, well, that's the political, um, the politics that come out of Washington that's de- obviously fully debatable. Now, whether these people also have an overview, I mean, they certainly, certainly had control, it would appear, over Roosevelt. And you wonder what else they, they have an influence over. Right. But I, I really don't, I really don't know the answer. Oh, Again, I, I'm just bringing up the facts and, you know, let others join in the discussion about what it actually means. <laughs> Fair. I get that. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough, man. I really do appreciate it. A great show hinges on a great guest, so I couldn't do it without you. But uh, uh, would you like to remind the people where they can get your books and anything else you have going on? I don't have a website because I don't have time with my proper job, my proper company. But hmm. uh, obviously, or bookshops, Amazon or whatever in Kindle or print version, God's Blueprint being the, being the recent one, Civilization 1 being the, the book that kicked this this whole measurement thing off. And it isn't too intimidating in terms of numbers, who built the moon and various other ones. But God's Blueprint, I think, um, covers my change from being a an atheist to um, believing in something quite huge. Hmm. So Amazon, I guess, or or any bookshop. Right on. Amazing. Well, Chris, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Mad respect. Take care of yourself out there. Thanks, Greg. Good to talk. All right, people. There we go. Now that is a THC I feel like we can be proud of, right? I think Chris has done a lot of research that is well worth hearing out. Connections between the makers of the pyramids to the makers of Stonehenge through the use of these measurements is quite a claim. Following them through Freemasonry is an intriguing road, too. I like a guest who lets me down easy when I ask the -the off-the-wall questions, but it's a conversation I consider educational, even if you don't agree with everything you hear. Like, I definitely don't think we're alone in the universe, and the absence of proof doesn't really mean we should conclude that there's nothing there. I think we should just say that until we can check every corner of the universe, maybe we should just put a pin in it, but that's just me. Either way, I'd say this one's got just the right balance of substance and speculation. The THC sweet spot, if there ever was one. And I hope you guys concur with that. We did have a couple early sound issues. I hope everyone made it past that. I don't know how I didn't catch it, but I was so into the material that all of a sudden I heard the crackling, and my first thought was, was this here the whole time? And going back, yeah, it kind of was. So, sorry. Uh, You know I go crazy about stuff like that, or at least you should. It did work out, though. Minus a few AOL messenger chimes on the guest's end, but what else is new? Here we have the fourth show of the month. Next episode, we'll have a Money Bomb winner. Keep an eye on your emails, people. And actually, I really got to ask you for a favor. God, I feel you cringing already. Another podcast host with a favor. Yeah, I know. I'm not the first. But I just like an iTunes or Stitcher review from you if you can. I barely ever ask because, honestly, you got to be operating on a higher level than begging the audience for iTunes reviews every show. But because I almost never ask, I see shows that I know don't have the same following, but they've got twice as many reviews, and those stupid things do matter. The system will put a well-reviewed show in front of more people, so do me that kindness if you can. It allows these fringe ideas to reach more people. Let's spread those breadcrumbs, because I just ask a couple times a year, and really, that should be all that's needed to keep us in the game. I do have a rating system on the Plus site, of course, but that doesn't go anywhere. That is just for me to see which shows are more popular than others, so don't feel the need to give me just a five-star review on that, because it's arbitrary, really, unless you think the show was that good. So I would appreciate it, but it's not the end of the world if you're busy. 
the bigger deal, of course, is plus. God, I wish everyone could and would just sign up. And I don't do any of this shady business of teasing things or asking a guest to hold off on their material till the second hour. I see shows that do that, and that's messed up and not really fair to the guest who wants the material to reach the largest audience that it can. So I shoot straight, and whatever happens, happens. But of course, the conversation gets deeper as it goes on, only natural, and I want every listener to hear it all, but I can't pay the rent with what I want, so... Help us both out. The archives are all there. Every show you've heard that you liked is double in length and sitting there waiting to be checked out if you just toss me five bucks. I try to make THC entertaining, but also valuable in terms of educational or thought-provoking subject matter. I don't think these are just your average throwaway podcasts about nothing. Maybe it is for some, but THC University is pretty cheap by comparison. And in this extended show, we got deeper into DC Is the geomancy of Washington, D.C. the reason why it's been so successful and dominant on the world stage since? I don't know. We also revisit the importance of this object recovered under the Temple of Jerusalem that was talked about in the first hour. And my favorite part, tracing back the elite families and tracking them through the power centers of the past. As we get into the elite, I had to ask if we see these measurements in the city of London or the Vatican. Had to ask Chris's thoughts on other conspiratorial scapegoats the waning influence of America, and where the hidden hand might be shifting to, all good stuff. I mean, if you remember, Chris said he's been told firsthand that 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemasons have their agenda set by some puppet master in the shadows. I mean, that was really interesting, right? Frater X, you might remember a while ago, he wrote a book about this Trojan horse of Freemasonry he considered to be the Scottish Rite. If you go back and listen to that show, I think it ties in here very nicely. We also talked about Atlantis or pre-cataclysm civilization and other fun stuff too. I highly recommend it. As for other news, the Q&A thread in the Plus forums is filling up again. I love how active they've been. I've been trying to get on there more. I definitely read everything. I'm still trying to get email notifications set for forum replies. That becomes the one thing that's hard for me is refinding a reply that someone might have given me, but the private messaging system is working great. And if you have any issues at all over there, just private message me because I will get that a lot easier than an email or a Facebook message amongst the chaos that is those inboxes. And I'm going to have to do a second Q&A bonus show soon, no doubt. I'm also hoping to have Graham back on in about 30 days-ish from now and have the Armenia video done right along with it. I think that's uh, appropriate and a good timeline for that. And the best bit of news really is this, because so many listeners like the closing songs that I have worked on with Lauren Silva specifically, and just lyrically, I mean, her and her guys do everything else, but we did a couple more, and I really, really love this one that I'm going to play today. It's a higher side twist on a popular song, and it touches a lot of the topics that we love dearly. And this, along with the other tracks, will be added to the downloadable list of songs on the Plus site. I put a lot of work into this show after last week's. I hope it paid off. I have more good ones coming, but until then, I gotta get out of here, and you gotta hear this song. So that's it for me, people. Your move, mysterious moon makers of the megalithic yard. Your fucking move. Oh no, you see. The world isn't random, it's attached to puppet strings Control over everything A nine to five is trying to steal ya Now don't that job seem silly? Hello, can you hear me? Or should I play back recordings from some spy agency? Wish we were younger and free I'll be thankful when it's all exposed The vast conspiracy There's such a difference Between us and the dance